ultimately what, what what i can say right now is that religions often are i mean they're their spiritual understanding their their understandings of the world but they're also methods for living your life and living your life successfully and this is very obvious with something like islam right if you look at islam if you look at the start of islam it pops up in the seventh century you have this guy he's a traitor a traitor is in a T-R-A-D-E-R. This is in there, this is in Arab states. There's multiple different religions. Muhammad, the uh, prophet of Islam, the main prophet of Islam, he makes a religion that's based on trade and benefiting other people that are in the religion, and it explodes. And it it and that's because it explodes because the methods and the rules that they had in Islam created a situation where they prospered. What is up, everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast, where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness, and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty, and physical and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We are on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica. So if that's a problem, kiss my ass. Okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, everybody. This is In Liberty and Health, episode number 213. I think I got that number right. It might be 212. 212, 213, somewhere in there. Uh, above 210. Anyways, today I got Mr. Sam Urban with me. How you doing, dude? Great. How are you doing, man? Excellent. And uh, stoked to have you here. You kind of hit me up out of the blue. You uh, threw up one of my tweets about not being a complete and total idiot, but also maintaining integrity. And uh, we kind of hit it off from there. So uh, I guess real quick, give an uh, introduction for yourself for my listeners. Yeah. So uh, my name's Samuel Urban. Um, I'm uh, from New England. I was in the Marine Corps for a few years after high school, left that to be a history teacher. Um, I, I finished my bachelor's degree, got certified to teach, did my student teaching, and then bailed on my master's degree. And uh, I just I run a few businesses and I do the podcast. I like uh, the podcast. I like to call it a cultural anthropology podcast. I have degrees in history and anthropology. So I bring in a lot of different things. Um, and I, I do that show weekly now on YouTube and on podcasts. Nice, man. Yeah, well, I was uh, listening to a few of them recently, and I uh, really, really enjoyed it. The one you did on caffeine was really interesting because uh, okay. not, not only is one of the sponsors of the show, um, you know, a, a coffee from uh, Fox & Sons, but uh, also I'm like a complete total caffeine addict, so, you know, I, I, I can't help it. Um, it was, it was oh, yeah. interesting to hear the uh, perspective there. So um, what kind of got you into digging into history? Because, like, I, I history is one of those things that I feel like it's just such a long thread to pull on, and I want to, but it's like, I don't even know where the fuck to start. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like I was reading like little history books when I was like really young. There's this uh, British series um, called Horrible Histories that's written for kids. Uh, somebody's probably heard of that. They're listening to this, like losing their shit because it's like a mm. in America, it's like not very well known. Um, mm. But it's like I loved them. There were these little books. Um, but what kind of got me on the path that I'm on, and I, I have an episode about this, um, around the path that I'm on, not just with history, but with the way that I interact with information was, you know, I'm 10, 11 years old. My dad loves history too. Um, and I lived for two years in Indonesia, fifth and sixth grade. Um, he got a job out there, um, cause he couldn't get a job in America anymore. This was like 2000 or this was right before 2008 when jobs were starting to go down. And, um, we went to Cambodia and I don't. Cambodia, there was the uh, Khmer Rouge genocide, and a third of the population was killed in like three or four years. Um, not getting into too much detail, it was kind of communist, but like you know, it was it was even less communist than other states that just go communist in name, but really they're just authoritarians that are like mm -hmm. giving a little bit of hearsay to Marx. But these guys, like Pol Pot, is kind of known as the anarcho primitive primitivist guy he like he basically killed he killed a third of the country killed you if you had glasses any connection to the old government just way beyond mouths for olds it was like um you know all this stuff so i i we go there it's it, you know it's cambodia so it's like thailand's mexico so it's like there's no regulations there's no you know they don't have wheelchair access at this place you know it's like mm -hmm. it's raw there's we go to these places there's mountains of skulls and there's um like a literal pyramid of skulls it's right there 
our guide shows us where a baby's bone has been like there's a baby's bone where a, a Khmer Rouge rebel smashed the baby on the tree and it's just there it's beyond it's like there's some sagging police tape in front of it and then we go into like this old school that um like it has blood on the wall it's like you can just touch it i didn't touch the wall but you could touch it um you think they'd like paint over it but it, you know it was really raw and i, I saw this and to, my, to be honest it was it was traumatizing and from there i had that really stuck in my head from like 10 or 11 years old so i was always thinking about the question of why we care about certain genocides and certain atrocities and don't care about others. Because at 11 years old, I have this propagandized view of the West and of the United States. And then I hear about this terrible thing that's happening, which I later find out has a lot to do with Henry Kissinger and our involvement in Southeast Asia. It probably wouldn't have happened without U.S. government involvement. And, you know, it just, it it shatters that. It shatters that. And then it leads me on this, this lifelong, um, up until this point, you know, I'm not, super old but it leaves me on this lifelong goal to answer this question of why we care about certain things and not care about others and it, i mean it ended up being my very related to my history thesis uh for my history undergrad mm -hmm. but yeah sorry long answer but that is that is really the root of most of what i do is is analyzing what is underneath the the actual stated reasons because almost always in history the stated reasons are not the entire story or even maybe the main one yeah, I, I really like the way that you kind of laid it out um, simply there at one point where kind of like, why do we care about certain things, but not the others? Because like when it comes to nutrition, I often think about this because there's always a demon whenever it comes to certain nutrition stuff, right? Like I was just going to bat against people with seed or, or about seed oils today because that's the current in thing right now. But though, you know, this is an easy thing to demonize because seed oils are in absolutely everything. Okay, so if you extrapolate correlation to causation here and say, okay, well, everybody now is sick and fat. So, you know, if pseudos are in everything, then that has to be the reason, right? Well, if you take more than two seconds to do some research and you'll find that, oh, no, they're actually cardioprotective compared to saturated fats. And not saying that you shouldn't consume saturated fats, but just when the studies are done comparing uh, canola oil to like saturated fats, you'll notice that there are, that um, canola oil is perhaps cardioprotective and actually, you know, doesn't harm people. But once again, this is the narrative that's pushed. And this is something I talk about, you know, just all throughout the show is just narratives that people push and certain things that they'll omit from their narrative whenever it doesn't fit, you know, whatever they're trying to push on to people. And I feel like probably what you've noticed in studying history is that there's a lot of omission and, you know, they may tell the truth a lot of the time, but it's that omission that doesn't give you the full picture and the full perspective. Right. A hundred percent. I mean, it, it's all selective and it, it happens at every single level because it's not only selecting for for what information to maybe put into textbooks mm -hmm. and what you find when you look into the textbooks that are being used to teach in schools. I mean, the funding behind those things goes back to like, and, and I'm not making this up, it goes back to the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers and their organizations funding things like that. Like they're made for a specific reason. Right. And I, to be honest, the way I see it in, in this in, in both the information we're being taught in things like nutrition, anything that's created by a university and a bunch of other things in our society, there it's like people in the West are, are because of all these things, living in a constant state of cognitive dissonance because everything they're interacting with has some other nefarious or, um, or even if it's not nefarious, some other purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're talking about information that's in textbooks or being taught in schools, there's levels of selection for, for all of it. I mean, it, there's not only the textbooks, but also the people who are teaching that information, what information is being taught in colleges, because, you know, the people that are teaching in our public schools and the government schools, they're not, they're not a cross section of American society. They're a subsection of American society that shares similar traits. And those traits are selected for not by the American people as a whole, but by uh, political institutions, social institutions, universities. And the people who select those teachers are chosen themselves by people even higher up. And these systems are, are, are set up for all sorts of different purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it almost sounds kind of like a self-perpetuating cycle because you're going to kind of self-select for people who, you know, 
exhibit certain behaviors, right? You're not going to pick a teacher that may seem like they may rock the boat in specific situations. Um, the other thing that you kind of said a little bit earlier on there was um, there's the lies aren't just at the top or necessarily at the bottom. It is at every level. And this is the thing that I really try to have people take away whenever they think about political systems is that um, tyranny cannot be enforced by a top down reign. Like, and that sounds kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people because, you know, we think of the U S government as like a totalitarian entity. But the problem is, is that you have people who kind of, exist within the culture right and who want that tyranny and who are going to do their part in making sure that the government's will gets enforced via just mm -hmm. certain behaviors right like they may tell you not to do things they may encourage you in certain ways to behave in a way that kind of complies with the state it's not just you know joe biden writes a law and then we all follow it it's right. the mindset that some people kind of um have to shape the culture and society around you know the state and the way that it interacts with our lives uh, yeah and and i don't i think what people don't really realize is that the way that people think about this stuff is not by accident it it's created it's it again to talk about the carnegies and the rockefellers once i started looking into things like this because you know i really like cultural anthropology and i really like history but my main focuses of history is like 1600s colonial American, love that, love world history, love Asian history, East Asian history. But I didn't look into a lot of this post-Civil War American stuff until recently. And having the background of all this other world history, all these other events, these interactions in the Bronze Age, these interactions in uh, colonial era, South Central America, as well as in North America, it, it it made me view these situations in a very particular way. And, and when I see the actions taken by someone like a Rockefeller and a Carnegie who have untold power, um, you know, I can compare it to someone else who had untold power in the past. And when people have untold power that we can't even really conceive of, we can at least compare it to different people and how they acted in that case. And I mean, I would I would literally compare like Carnegie or Rockefeller um, through a sort of soft power rather than the hard power of a monarchy, but you could compare them to like um, somebody like uh, Philip of Spain, who has this massive Habsburg empire where it's it's through the Netherlands, it's it's everything. But the level of power that these people have and and what they were able to change, um, if you want me to get into specifics about the education system, I I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Carnegie. Yeah, so. Um, you know, people, I, what I hear a lot about the education system is that our education system is based on the Prussian model of the 1800s. And that is true. The, the Prussian model from Prussia, which became Germany, this is a very, this is from the era of nationalism in Europe. It's a very uh, nationalistic, very uh, patriotic. It teaches discipline and it teaches obedience. And this is the model that uh, New England, which New England had public schools in 1635. There were Native Americans shooting arrows at the schoolhouse doors. They had been there for like three years and they are setting up public schools because there's always been this, this thing in New England, in the United States. So New England, the area of the country I'm from, has always created the, uh, the educational path for the country. And this is primarily Massachusetts and Connecticut. So Massachusetts and Connecticut, they decide they're going to run with the, uh, the Prussian model in the mid-1800s. And they institute the Prussian model and they institute, uh, there, there's a few different styles at this point. There's um, common schools, uh, the, the the Prussian schools that were called something else. But what happens in the early 1900s, and I don't see this talked about as much, is, uh, and this starts in the late 1800s, is that the Carnegies and the Rockefellers uh, under the education, the General Education Board, which becomes the Rockefeller Foundation mm -hmm. and the Carnegie Foundation, they explicitly... Um, change the education system. They they pump money into the education system. They pump money in the NEA, which existed at the time, but it was kind of a different thing, um, using whatever methods of these organizations, using the structure of them to change them irrevocably. They, um, uh, they, they took over the unions. They took over the colleges uh, through funding certain schools and not funding others. And then they controlled the curriculum through not only... Um, controlling the individuals who are making up this place, but also where the funding comes from and not funding other schools that wouldn't play ball. So they were essentially forced to. But this is a type of force that we have often in the West, which is 
it, it's through incentives. They incentivize certain people mm-hmm. to, to, to do what they want them to do. And then they disincentivize others by not helping them. And then by relation, they're now worse off because they're helping the people that are mm-hmm. doing what they want to. And this creates an illusion that this is somehow happening organically. And this is the best thing for the country when in fact, it's the best thing for this individual who wants things to be a certain way. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh. Sorry. I said, too much <laughs> no no no. it's okay um yeah it, it's, it's interesting because i i think about this a lot as well when it comes to like media and the way that we kind of look at its influence um i, I like the way that you put that soft power um i feel like people don't really look at the world as current as they should because like mainstream news is no longer like your legacy media right and i feel like a lot of people kind of to throw that line out there like hey this is mainstream news which would be considered you know more of a soft power um they look at that when it kind of suits them and then they'll say oh but tucker carlson and joe rogan and tim pool get more downloads than cnn msnbc and all the mainstream news okay well at what point can we start adjusting our focus and say that this is now the mainstream because they're they have a much larger audience um, and, and there's like a dialectic of, okay, well, the old media, you know, the legacy media still has an influence on government, but how much? Like, mm-hmm. I, I think the tide's turning, and I think a lot of people are, are kind of playing this to their own benefit. Well, they're, where, like I said, they'll say, hey, you know, I'm oppressed because of this, but I'm not oppressed because of this. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. people just kind of pick and choose when they want to um fit these narratives i know that's not entirely relevant to your point but i, oh, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. you kind of get where i'm going no yeah 100 mm-hmm. percent. it's um I, and i think that like while yes by the numbers tim pool joe rogan they blow cnn fox out of the water but those cnn's and foxes abc's nbc's they have an audience and a credibility with the right people and it's not like right. um you know and and this is something that. Um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the Good Old Boys podcast, but uh, Bog Beef and Mar Mar Black, I think. Uh, but Bog Beef, he he hammers in patronage theory, which is the idea that there are clients and patrons, and um, you know there there's there's levels of it. There's there's a top patron, clients below him, they have their own clients, you know, down and down and down, mm-hmm. and this. That, that type of thing, you don't need 90% of the population to, to do, to, to, to do what you want to, because mm-hmm. when you, when you have the, the upper, upper echelons of American Western international society, there's people slightly below that, you know, there, there's always a bigger yacht. Um, and it goes down and down from there. And you only need like the top 10%. I mean, if you can, in, in Marxism, they would call this like a kulak, right? Like there are certain people with more that, keep the system for those below them. And um, I, I kind of think that's what's happening is that, and here's something that that uh, demonstrates this really well for me is, have you heard the term uh, Latinx? This is an yeah. example I always bring up, right? Mm-hmm. So Latinx is a term, if you go to Pew Research, you look up a poll, mm-hmm. only 4%, I think it's a poll from like the last four years, only 4% of Hispanic people actually prefer the term Latinx. What's up, everybody? Um, we're going to take a quick break and tell you about the show's sponsors. Um, we are brought to you by Element T Electrolytes. I've been using this stuff for years, and what I've honestly found is that if I didn't have electrolytes before some kind of cardio, and sometimes even before workouts, that my workout performance, or definitely cardio performance, would suffer greatly. Um, Sodium is responsible for every single movement pretty much in your entire body. And let's say you drink a lot of caffeine, like I like to do, then um, maybe it is a good idea, like I do every single morning, um, put some LMNT chocolate electrolytes um, there in your coffee to get a little bit more sodium, potassium, and uh, magnesium in your coffee so that way whatever diuretic effect you get from the caffeine is pretty much diluted by the fact that you put chocolate salt in it. Um, also, it tastes really, really good. Get some uh, chocolate creamer, hazelnut creamer, or even coconut. Now mix that all up. It tastes really, really good. So uh, yeah, make sure you drop by, go to drinklmnt.com slash in liberty and health and uh, pick you up some electrolytes today. All right, guys. Thanks. Um, it's like the two thirds of them prefer Hispanic. Latino is a close second. 
Latino or Latina. But if you're in a university, you have to use the term Latinx. That's the preferred term. And um, that represents like an extreme subsection of American society. And of course, there are certain Hispanic people at these universities who do use Latinx. Right. And they'll use that as an example. But because it's it's based in this small, small world, even though 5% of the people, only 5% of the people that it applies to use it, the people in universities, because they're in their small bubble, even though 19 out of 20 people that this term describes don't use it, mm -hmm. it's still the term that they use and they think it's right. And they truly think it's right. I mean, it's crazy. And if you go up higher in schools, because you know I went to the University of Connecticut, it's a pretty good public school. And it's a, I mean, it's a really good education school by their standards, which is dog shit, but it's a, um, in, in their standards, I mean, the federal, uh, secretary of education went to my university for, for education. So, you know, it's not like I'm talking about some backwater education college. This is representative of the, um, uh, of the upper echelons of mm. these universities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. I think the one thing that most people probably notice is that like the things move kind of on the margin. So like when we talk about IQ stuff, which I know people are going to poo poo, but that's fine. Um, there's a lot of dumb men and then there's a lot of really, really smart men where there's not quite as much in the middle. Right. Right. Now it's a those... flatter bell curve. Right. Right. Yeah. So like all your stupid men are going to, you know, make up all the people who, you know, you want to say are stupid and can't do anything right or whatever. And then all your smart men are going to be the guys who kind of, you know, change history, right? The, there's going to be, you know, a higher class of people who have a, you know, a pretty high IQ. And there's going to be the ones who are like Bruce Dickinson or Elon Musk. And the reason why I say Bruce Dickinson is because not only do I love Iron Maiden, but also like dude flies a jet and then has been touring in a band with this operatic voice, if that's even a yeah. word, for like the last like 40, 50 years. I'd consider yeah. that dude probably one of the most gifted, you know, probably like that top 1% of people where, you know, yeah. you kind of see just most More things play out. Yeah. in kind of like this Pareto distribution fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And it, um, and, and the thing, I mean, like, you know, you go one order of magnitude higher on IQ or really on most things. And it's like, there's 10% less people at that stage. But there's there's like you go down and this applies to so many things and there's just more and more people. Mm -hmm. And when you're if you're a professor, you're a tenured professor making one hundred thousand dollars a year, you are a client of this system that there's mm -hmm. someone above you who is like the dean making eight hundred thousand dollars a year. And that's bullshit that he's making eight hundred grand, but you're making one hundred grand. So you're going to protect that system. Right. right. Um, yeah, it's that type of thing. It's hard to, uh, I, one of the sayings I've, I've heard and I really like is um, it's hard to get somebody to believe something if their salary depends on them not believing it. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, this is, there's so many things like this in history. I mean, historiography, which is the, the study of the study of history, essentially, it's like meta history. It's like the methods we use for history. Um, but it's really, historiography is so important because essentially historiography is the magic that they do in order to, um, in order to sell the narrative that needs to be sold. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that like the stuff that's written down is not what actually happened, but it's like you were saying at the beginning, it's, it's what's concentrated on, it's who's concentrated on the information, it's how it's talked about. I mean, it's, it's how you get to a point where like we had that blockbuster movie, right? The Woman King, which was about this tribe in Africa. Um, it was about these women warriors in Africa and they put out this movie where they're supposed to be this, this heroic group of women. And it would have been really cool as a historical story if they, if they were true to the story, but mm -hmm. these women were, were in, in reality, they were, they needed the women to become warriors because so many of their men are dying from warfare and they were enslaving other people like a lot of African kingdoms did at the time. And people like to like, a lot of times what you'll hear is that people will downplay the um, the involvement of uh, of African kingdoms in the slave trade. But that is an element of historiography trying to uh, trying to downplay the involvement of this aspect of this evil triangle trade. Right. They're they're downplaying the actions of who they don't want to um, who they don't want to talk poorly about. But in doing that, you're deciding 
how you're going to view history and then you're deciding who gets a pass and who doesn't and you're deciding what criteria uh you're going to use based on that because at the end of the day uh, you can say that the europeans created the market so they were the ones who were um because they needed the slaves they wanted to buy the slaves so then other people made this other people captured the slaves to sell them they created the incentive but there's nothing immutable about that that makes that somehow worse than being the people that are capturing the slaves. I mean, you can argue it all you want, but at the end of the day, that is an argument. And I think that's what people miss about history is that history is all arguments. And, and there it, it's made up of facts or things we think are facts. Sometimes they're not, but it's it's past the facts, past the dates. It's it's all argument. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. One thing that I've kind of been talking about quite a bit is uh, intersexual dynamics. And I'm curious because um, the one trope I hear tossed around quite a bit, and, and I don't know exactly what to think about this. Um, people say that like the nuclear family is a new invention and, um, you know, that, that it's, I think pe people just kind of like downplay its presence throughout history. And I do believe that, like, as humans, we aren't necessarily strictly monogamous, but we realize that just over time that, hey, this just happens to be the best way to kind of raise a family and develop a prosperous society. Because if you look over history, and you would definitely know this much better than I do, um, the more polygamous societies tend to be a little bit more violent. And I think that's reasonably so, because, like, as a guy, your main imperative is, like, hey, I want to know that the child is mine if my wife's fucking around then i don't know if that child's mine so therefore if there's somebody that impregnated my wife i'm gonna go kill that motherfucker or yeah. i'm gonna kill his offspring um yeah. when you talked about cult or cultural anthropology i know that's kind of like one of your big things um how much have you kind of dived into that aspect and like how relationships and you know gendered relations kind of play throughout history because this is just such a fascinating topic to me yeah, so there are a number of different types. Um, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but what if Alt Hist, if you've heard of him, he's a history YouTuber. He has a really, really great like 50 minute video on um, the different types of family homes uh, mm -hmm. over history. So if you if you go to China prior to um, uh, prior to the uh, to Mao's revolution, prior to the Marxist revolution, they have like multi generational homes where uh, where people live, where like you have like three generations and the patriarch is at the top. That's like probably the grandfather, and then there's generations living around a courtyard. In and this would be Ming, where the families, other families, the sons and their wives would stay. And I mean, this is this is basic cultural anthropology. You would learn about like things like patrilocal. Um, or matrilocal, which is whether these are terms that refer to whether the wife, uh, the new wife, the bride, or the groom moves in with the groom's family or the bride's family. So where they move in. So in some places, and there's different reasons for this, the women move in with the men. Some places the men move in with the women. And then there are different, again, different types of um, systems of like, pat and then there's pat that was patrilocal and matrilocal. And then there's patrilineal and matrilineal. And that refers to like in Judaism, um, it's passed through the woman. That is matrilineal. In Western culture, it's passed through the man. That's patrilineal. Um, and all this is is cultural anthropology. Um, but you you ask some of these families. So different styles of families. So essentially, the uh, the family unit and how it is functions, how it functions, um, is different in different parts of the world, and that has different implications for other. Um, uh, for other things that happen in societies, the other way that things are organized. China is the most obvious example for this because Confucianism is uh, one of their systems of understanding. There's also things like legalism, Taoism, but Confucianism um, is about the relationships between um, between like boss and worker, you know, between landlord and tenant, between father and son, mother and daughter, and it in between people in the state and different levels of the state. So it's it that is a standardization of the way that people interact within their family and, and within their society at a, at a greater point. Um, and I, I had one last thing that was closer to your question. 
Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah. Basically, just kind of like w- the idea of the nuclear family being a relatively right. new thing. Um, like I said, my idea is that I believe that we were always kind of polygamous as a species, but that we grew to become more monogamous just because we realized that's right. like, the best way for a society to prosper. So w- w- one of the Ten Commandments, right, is uh, is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of times I'm, I'm about to start this multi-episode series on the anthropology of religion which is actually like the most Ooh. specific one that i like okay yeah um so this is going to be about specifically this i'll i'll send you a twitter dm and and we'll get into it um but ultimately what what, what i can say right now is that religions often are i mean they're they're spiritual understanding their their understandings of the world but they are also methods for living your life and living your life successfully and this is very obvious with something like Islam, right? If you look at Islam, if you look at the start of Islam, it pops up in the seventh century. You have this guy; he's a trader. A trader is in a T R A D E R. This is in there, this is in Arab states. There's multiple different religions. Muhammad, the uh, prophet of Islam, the main prophet of Islam, he makes a religion that's based on trade and benefiting other people that are in the religion and it explodes and it it and that's because it explodes because the methods and the rules that they had in Islam created a situation where they prospered mm-hmm. and that's what these rules these socially constructed rules about um uh about monogamy come from because like you said it's less violent but if you go to a hunter gatherer society some of them are monogamous, but a lot of them in a more, um, the term primitive, you know, is, is a relative term. But when I'm saying primitive, what I mean by primitive is like, it's, it's not a term that people like to use in anthropology today. But when I say primitive, I'm talking about like very little levels of, um, of social construction. So you're down closer to this state of nature that would have been described by John Locke during the Enlightenment. So this is when there are no, there aren't like socially constructed laws. There aren't methods of understanding you're not using a fork you don't have common courtesies there there aren't these things that have been created for the society it's just if you read a book about Papua New Guinea especially 100 years ago this is like a anthropologist paradise people would tell you there's a quote from some ethnography that I've read that is like if you meet a man if you're in Papua New Guinea and you meet a man and you don't speak his language um you have to either run or kill him because it's like there's no trust in these societies, right? And when you're in one of these societies where it's a state of nature, it's um, it's it's whatever, then you're more likely to have this polygamy where men are going to have multiple wives. If they're stronger, they can handle keeping multiple wives. Whereas in our societies that are uh, more settled, less horticulturalist and hunter-gatherer, more agriculturalist, this is heavy, these are larger cities – it helps the stability of the nation for men to not be killing each other and for them to instead be making children, especially when you're shifting from hunter gatherer to living in a city, Mm -hmm. your people are less strong. They're less healthy. I'm sure as a nutrition guy, you know this, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to put a, I I don't want to necessarily put a pin in that, but um, it's also because, no, 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 that's okay. Um, I I don't want to interrupt your flow because I'm really digging all this stuff, but like, when you live in a city or kind of like in the modern lifestyle that we're, you know, we're literally talking over the internet right now, mm-hmm. your basic needs are afforded, right? Like you have toilet paper, you have running water, you have air conditioning, you can have dogs if you want. Yeah. I don't have any of my three in here. <laughs> I thought I did. <laughs> you had them before. They were, they were there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know my mini pin. She'll normally come in like sleep or something, but um, all your basic needs are afforded to you. So that way you don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. But in this kind of more primitive society, which you said Papua New Guinea and like what, that'd be like the 1920s even. Yeah. I mean, if you're in Papua New Guinea in the 1920s, there are places in Papua New Guinea in the 1920s that aren't much different from today in Papua New Guinea. There's other mm. parts that aren't like that, but it's, it's one of the most still uh like wild places in the world and it's very okay. diverse which is another part of it there's like thousands not thousands but there's hundreds of languages okay. and like dozens of language families oh that's that's actually really interesting i didn't know that i i mm-hmm. just uh the only thing i know about papua new guinea right now is that uh the u.s is sending a bunch of troops over there and their military built up against china which co- completely or, yeah, yeah, yeah a, a whole other podcast for that but um yeah. w- it's interesting because like you're almost starting to see this now again where like Women, because they've been introduced to social media, right? And this isn't to say that there's anything wrong with social media, but like 
they're exposed to a global sexual marketplace where they can basically flaunt their value all over the world and get attention from anybody all over the world. Mm -hmm. This was never afforded to women. Now, on the other hand, men can have free 4K streaming porn at any time. Men were never afforded this opportunity either when they were, you know, in a society like that. So we have to learn to live with these things. I see people saying, oh, ban porn all the time. And it's like, well, well, you know, what do you think that that's not going to fix anything because you're putting a bandaid on the problem. Men still have a fucking sex drive. We want to fuck. <laughs> we want to have kids. We, we want to do manly things. A part of that is a sex drive. If you ban porn, I guarantee you it's going to fester in another way, whether it be increased prostitution, increased violence, something is going to happen as a yeah. consequence of this thing that we've become accustomed to. Um, I think a lot of people don't look at like the nuts and bolts of this, but kind of the point I'm getting to here is that now we're starting to see more and more civil unrest, you know, like society's not quite as intact as it used to be. You start to see patterns of women are willing to share a high value man. Right. And then the men who don't quite measure up to that, they're more and more invisible, right? Where if you aren't kind of like in the top 20%, let's say, women don't notice you anymore. Like men are just completely invisible. Like they cannot get a date worth their life. And I think there were um, stats done by like Bumble and Hinge and all these other dating apps where it's like women only rated, it it was like, I I think 30 to 15% of the men attractive, whereas men rated like 80% of women attractive. So you kind of see where this is going. Mm -hmm. And it it is that just women's nature is that they always want a better deal. So, you know, now they're more willing to share a man kind of like they used to, rather than find a guy who's kind of like a little bit better than them. They want the better deal because they're exposed to a global sexual marketplace. I know it's a long tirade, but I I think I kind of summed it up well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there was a quote that summarized this recently that I, I heard from somewhere, which is like, you know, like 30 years ago, the hot girl from your high school would be dating the quarterback of the high school. Yeah. <laughs> but today, the hot girl from your high school is like Dating in Pete Therian. Davidson's DMs. Like it's not <laughs> right. Like it's it's um it's a different thing and and that happens on a smaller scale. Like if I I have a lot of friends that just they they can't like like they can't do anything with women to save their life. And it's it's uh this goes into so this really sits on something that I do all the time. Basically, all of what I do, which is everything that I do comes back to analyzing modern society. And I do that through indigenous examples and history and all this different stuff. But ultimately, it all comes back down to how our human monkey brains mm-hmm. are um, are interacting with modern technology. And dating apps is a perfect example i love that you brought it up because like it really is crazy because you know we're used to being we we evolved right in hunter-gatherer states and we were in small hunter-gatherer bands and there are different you know it's it's different based on your environment because it's it's different based on technology and needs everywhere that's how culture is formed is through a response to um to your uh to your environment so in a second, I will tell you about marriage practices in some parts of Mongolia, because that's very interesting and related to this. But it's in what we have today. I mean, it's an unprecedented situation, like so many other situations that we have. And it's one of these other things that it's it's not necessarily tied directly to the cognitive dissonance that I was talking about, where you're interacting with the world differently. But it is one of these things where this freak situation has been created. Like dating apps are basically seed oils in an app because like seed oils, right? Like I, I, I don't, I don't know how bad seed oils are, but at the root of it, it's like these seed oils don't exist in nature, right? They're like hyper It's just basically, yeah. So like yeah. the way that I look at seed oils and sugar, um, I don't think of them as inherently bad. It's just the fact that like, if I give you a teaspoon full of seed oils and sugar, it's going to taste fucking delicious. So you're not going to want to stop eating. And if yeah. I put that into a brownie, now I just added another 300 calories plus the, you know, 250 calories of the seed oils and sugar. And yeah. now, you know, you get no nutrition from it, but you just got 500 calories that tasted awesome, but it literally amazing. did nothing for you. Jesus. So that, that that's, it's just kind of like the, you're just ultimate dopamine hit and nature you know, doesn't our, make that man right nature our lizard brains yeah no it yeah. can't 
our lizard brains interpret that as holy fuck this is a lot of energy and we don't understand like our lizard brain doesn't understand like this nutrition is readily available at all times you know you right. go back 500 years even they didn't have access to the same food that we have now um or i shared quantities. A graph, right and quantities especially that's the mm-hmm. big part um see there she is right there um, it, i shared a graph yesterday from a, a guy i had on my podcast actually it was the best podcast i ever did or well at least like most popular that is on youtube um the graph over the last like 60 years we just eat more of everything it's not one thing or the other and funny enough the um the macronutrient that we eat the least more of is animal proteins but we blame those for all disease which is kind of funny but um mm. animal and plant proteins uh, collectively people eat about 500 calories of protein per day which is like nothing like that is not enough for anybody who's like seriously resistance training or wanting to just live a healthy life really because um protein's the most satiating macronutrient it also helps you know with bone structure and longevity tons of great bonuses about protein i you know i've, I've done plenty of podcasts on it but like that's the thing that we eat the least of. And then we ate more oils, you know, fats, we ate more carbohydrates, sugars, shit like that, but none of it's from healthy stuff. So people want to blame it on one thing or the other, but like, you know, our, our lizard brain just can't understand that this food is so readily available because, you know, mm-hmm. we had to deal with famines and we'd have to go hunt and kill our food. Well, guess what? Now you call the Uber Eats driver and he brings you Domino's, a whole pizza with the uh, cinnamon sticks and it's delicious, yeah. but you don't need that much energy anymore. No, exactly. You yeah. don't. And, and you certainly don't need to store it for later because like in, in the past, basically up until 1850, anybody could be subjected to a famine and be starving right. and not like food insecurity today. I mean, like the fact that yeah. in America, the poor people are fat. Mm-hmm. It, it's and I'm not saying that like, oh, the poor people are fat. They suck. I'm saying that like, that's notable that it's in our culture, the poor people are fat rather than starving to death. Because for 99.999% of human history, the poorest people, the people with the least access to resources are going to be skinny and die younger um, because they don't have enough nutrients, not because they have too much nutrients, right? Right? Because it's, um, it's because those things don't exist in, in nature. And that's, you know, that's, that's what that that's what our our culture does it processes more and more and more and i i don't know if you listened to one of my episodes where i talked about this because i think i talked about it in the caffeine episode but i also did it like in the drug episode and then i i talked about it in another one as well for something slightly different um and medicine i talked about it in medicine last week's episode but about processing from like you know the hallucinogens in a culture in the past would have been like uh like in in Ethiopia, it was like tree bark, and then there's like mush psilocybin mushrooms, and then there's like mezcal. It's like there's a shaman like grinds it a little bit, and that's the processing. And then later you have like um you have slightly more processing in it where it's in like, you know, you have like teas, like ayahuasca teas, and then even later you get into things you it starts to be chemicals in the form of like LSD and things like that. And you know, with apply that logic of more and more processing to opiates and you go from chewing poppies to smoking poppies to um to morphine and then you fast forward 70 years and you have a like a a a one percent of a penny's worth of fentanyl and you put it on your lips and you die in like 10 minutes and that that's what happens it's it's like the over processing over time that like um yeah That's, that's what I wanted to say. (laughs) That's that's what our society is. I think that that like, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's a metaphor that applies to so many different things, but that's something that like the over-processing over time of what our society does is something that I think people should understand. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting because like you, you saying that it's funny. I have this, you know, Samsung Galaxy Active watch on my wrist. Okay. Well, you go back literally 40 years ago, and this would have been the size of this TV screen, which, like, I'm about six feet tall, so my my wingspan's pretty long. Um, yeah. you buy a TV that's this fucking big now, and it's three hundred dollars, right? It's three or four hundred dollars. I mean, my wife and, and it's I were light. Like, yes, my wife and I were literally just looking through a Costco thing before I came on here, and for a 65 inch LED TV from Costco, it was three hundred thirty dollars. Dude, mm-hmm. even in our lifetime, 20 years ago, that was $1,000. Yeah, Easy. and it weighed 200 pounds. <laughs> right. Yeah. And now we're at the point where I have this 35-inch monitor right in front of me, and I got this for free from a speeding ticket at McDonald's when I worked there. So, like, just just like how yeah. we 
just are able to develop so rapidly. Okay, yeah, and then yeah. my wife's phone here. So, you know, to do everything that this phone does, um, once again, 40 years ago, you wouldn't need this whole computer. You wouldn't need a camera. You wouldn't need a flash drive that you would have had yeah. to carry in like this. You would need so much stuff. But though, um, it's really amazing to think that just in like the last 200 years, or, you know, you, you could even short it to like 150 years, the advancements that we've made and how much we've just like, put humanity as a whole on a different trajectory and the other thing that i'm curious your opinion on and you can kind of take it wherever from here is like a birth control so like i don't think people i don't think we still fully understand the ramifications of literally stopping a natural process inside of women's Mm -hmm. bodies i mean that is like astronomically huge that was never done in human history so like that's playing with fire and we have no idea what that could do do you want me to speculate about the, I mean, I, I really, the, what I could say the most about is the social implications of that, or, or do you want me to talk about the actual medical side? Because as far as hormones go, I don't know, but, um, wherever you want. So so socially, you know, so we can talk about what hormones themselves do to women's bodies or men's bodies, anybody's body though, you know, you're fucking with stuff that you got some major hubris. If you think you fully understand that because doctors, nutrition science, like, very smart people, it doesn't mean they understand the intricacies of the human body. They mm-hmm. don't. They, I mean, they truly, truly do not. Um, but socially, from a perspective of, like, how it changes everything, if you can consistently have sex and not get pregnant. Because, like, like I, I don't, I'm not going to share my opinion on abortion whether it should be legal or not it's one of those things with libertarians where it violates the nap it doesn't violate the nap or whatever Mm -hmm. but like i don't personally have a very strong opinion on it it just makes me sad and i wish i like you know it sucks but um but when you're talking about like we have abortion we have birth control we have all these things that mean that you as a man and as a woman in different ways, they have less responsibility when having sex, Mm -hmm. you know? So, and, and there's something to that where if you live in a society where you understand, and then over time, culturally, when that's in people's brains, when they're from a little baby, their mom and their parents, they've accepted birth control and they think birth control is okay. Then the kids grow up in a world where birth control is not only acceptable, but it's normal. And what I think about that and what I have most to say about that is that the social idea, the relationship with sex that people have shifts from sex being something that is about procreation and about pleasure, of course, to something that can just be about pleasure and that can be everyone's interaction with it because if you say to somebody today and this is an argument that i fully believe is completely relevant and completely valid if you say to them well if you don't want to have a kid just don't have sex people are under the impression fully many people in the west and other parts of the world are under the impression that they are entitled to have sex without the consequences that Ah. sex is supposed to bring Mm -hmm. and there's lots of things like that in our society where people think that they can just like, and this is the first time in in world history where you could, you could uh, consistently do that because now we have safe abortions in all of the West, Mm -hmm. you know, like in the past you could get an abortion, but it's going to be made by some literal, like a fucking witch basically, who's going to mix up some herbs that are going to hopefully kill the baby. But you know, they don't have anesthesia like science. So they might kill you. Because if they make it strong, like they have to make it strong enough to kill the baby and not kill you. And that's going to fuck you up. So it's a dangerous thing to get an abortion back then. Mm -hmm. And then it's a dangerous thing to give birth. There's this massive commitment. Whereas, you know, once you, it turns from 1800 to 1950 and everything has changed about the world. Everything has changed about the world. And you talked about the technological advance of 200 years. When we talk about the technological advance between 800 or 1800 and 2000 or 1820 and and 2020, the rate and the acceleration of technological change is just so much that there we can't, the human brain is not designed to make sense of it. And it creates a disconnect between generations. It creates a disconnect between um, individuals of slightly different ages. There's 
and it creates a disconnect in society between the elders in that society. And when I say elders in that society, you look to someone like Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Diane yeah. Feinstein. Um, like if you, if you lived in the 1300s in a, in England or France or whatever, between 1300 and 1400, there was technological advance, but you and your dad's family and you and your dad oh. or your mom and your grandfather lived basically the same life, basically the exact same life. And at the point in their life, when they're when your grandparents were older, your parents were older, they're going to be giving you advice based on their life. And that is going to be relevant advice. Mm -hmm. But today you get advice from your dad. Mm -hmm. That advice hasn't been relevant since 2006. Right. Okay. So one interesting thing that kind of popped into my mind, I got a couple notes here so that when we go back to some points, because I, I we're jumping all over the place here and I yeah, love sorry. it. That's what I, I do. No, 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 dude. It's awesome. I, I really like it. Um, when you were talking about that, it kind of popped into my mind. Like I'm thinking about, so I'm a fourth generation mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. What my dad knows versus what I know, it's like completely separate, right? Mm -hmm. Like when it yeah. comes to like- It's the, mechanical versus technician working with computer shit, right? Right, right. Like when it comes yeah. to computer stuff, I'm a whiz at that stuff. And like my dad's good at electrical because he, you know, that's kind of like, I, I think it's almost inherited yeah. <laughs> through me, or, um, you know, from him to me. Mm -hmm. But like my grandfather would have had no idea. Like if I would have showed him the Cadillac Lyric, which is the fully electric Cadillac SUV and the thing's a bad motherfucker. Yeah, where's if the I carburetor? Show, yeah, <laughs> my grandfather would have had no idea. My dad, same deal. He's like, you know, like I, I don't fully understand this. My dad's fifty four, um, and you know, everybody knows I'm twenty eight. But like, you know, our understanding of vehicles and just the way they developed over time, it's amazing. Even the ten years that I've been in the automotive industry, it's like, holy fuck, are they moving, dude? Um, seriously, yeah, I mean, you, I yeah. If you look back to like the eighties, they had OBD one and then you had OBD two um in 1996 where they started adding all, all these different modules and we're still running with OBD two, which is just like the computer inside vehicles. Um, you know, you had like a engine control module back in the eighties, and that was like it. And then you had an engine control module and a brake control module and then a tranny control module up until like I would say maybe like nineteen ninety eight. And now like today, there's sometimes fifty control modules in a vehicle. Yep. One for the for the TV for the back massager. I'm not kidding when I say that either. Oh, I know, um, I know. Heated seats, the radio, the radio control, the HVAC system, the HVAC controls themselves. Um, there's so many different modules, but I mean, this goes to the point that we just—it's insane the technology that just keeps developing and developing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's so let's talk about the complexity of technology right now because this sure. is very very important because. We can talk about the complexity of technology being on a spectrum, and that is that that makes sense. Okay, technology moves gradually over time, but there are more than just spectrums in technology, and this ties into a lot of different things. Okay, so um, industrial revolution happens in the 1800s, right? And this changes the way that uh, people work with with stuff everywhere in the world. Okay, there's mm -hmm. For hundreds of years, for, for thousands of years almost, there are uh, artisans, guilds, and craftsmen. And these institutions hold a lot of power. They hold no power today. They're gone. But for hundreds of years, these were like upper class societies right under the nobility. And these societies created things. They they were artists who had a craft and they they made stuff. And the, they would have been making guns. They would have been making um, like, like muskets. But... 1800s industrial revolution this stuff gets standardized it starts to get standardized and then the craftsmen over time gradually they lose all power mm -hmm. but that's not the important part i want to talk about i want to talk about a little bit later where this shit changes all right guys we are going to take a quick break from the show to tell you about the show's sponsor we are now brought to you by fox and sons coffees you can see right here i got the den blend dark really enjoy that um i've been drinking a lot of their brazil honey prep Right here, as you can hear, there's not a lot of beans left in it because I've been drinking it quite a bit. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Fox and Sons, why I support them and why you should too, is that uh, Stephen had started the company up in Michigan to help teach his son about entrepreneurship. Um, I'm all about that. And I do firmly believe that in order to spread liberty in our lifetimes, we have to support those who support similar values as us. And Stephen does support all the same libertarian values that I bring and talk about on the show a lot. So go to foxandsons.com, use code Kyle at check 
checkout to get 15% off of orders, $25 or more. And there's always free shipping whenever you place an order that is more than $37.99. Um, find their coffee absolutely fantastic, and I'm sure you will too. So uh, one more time, go to foxandsons.com, use code KYLE at checkout to get yourself a little discount, let them know I sent you, and support the coffee that supports you. All right, guys, thanks. Back to the show. World War One is really weird technologically with, with the stuff that happens. It's often talked about in history as this marriage between this old nationalistic line battle shit with the new technology that we have. Mm -hmm. But there is another shift that happens between World War One and World War II and with the World War II technology. In World War II and around World War II, around the time period, the uh, technology needed and the the manufacturing equipment needed to produce anything became so complicated that factories could no longer be converted easily. So they were no longer going to be converted. So factories were built for a purpose, right? So you would, if you wanted a gun factory, you would build a gun factory. You want a tool factory, you build a tool factory. And you might, I don't know if you see where I'm going with this yet, mm -hmm. but this is where the military industrial complex comes from because now what happens is you have a system where they they have ramped up production they have ramped up production to produce guns to produce to produce uh like ships tanks yeah. all this different stuff and now that infrastructure has been created it exists in these assets that these rich people own that these large capitalist class donor class whatever you want to call it that they own and they can no longer be converted to produce consumer goods in any sort of reasonable way. Mm -hmm. So now they're a class of their own. And now they're an industry that, just like the guilds, advocates for themselves. And it's a self-perpetuating industry. Right. You have Eisenhower warn against it. And then here we are 70 years later. And, you know, we left enough, we, we left enough weapons in Afghanistan to make them the second largest military on earth. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true, but they left a lot of stuff there. Right. Um, and that happened in a lot of different situations. They they outsourced. They This is basically where when lobbyists start as well. This is when managers start and then it accelerates in things like the 80s. They um, the technology required uh, got complex enough that the legislators could no longer understand. So they now have to take advice. They now have to take advice from these experts and these experts mm. invariably would become infiltrated by special interests like the Carnegie's like the Rockefeller's like everyone else like them. Um, and those allow for all sorts of changes that are completely not in line with, um, with helping the United States as a country or any other country or its people to prosper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm like envisioning this, it's literally like a snowball where you constantly have things rolling. So kind of like you said, you had factories and then the factories, you know, had to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, okay, well now you need more factories and these factories aren't advanced enough. So then you have, you know, you start just building and building and building. And then, you know, instead of having like, you know, your local congressman, well now your local congressman has like a whole group of staffers underneath him. Mm -hmm. And then he answers to, you know, their superior. And then you, you have managers of the staffers and just over time, you need more and more people because society gets more and more complex over yeah. time that's and kind more of how specialized I'm, more right. specialized yeah um one thing that uh we said we would go back to that i put a note in was uh marriage in the uh or marriage practices in mongolia yes yeah right okay so in um in some parts of mongolia this is somewhat still a practice mm -hmm. um oh, okay so first th th this is one that's less weird and this this happened in mongolia forever like this yeah. happened to genghis khan like Genghis Khan's origin story literally involves this, I think, with his mother. Mm -hmm. um, they, and this happened in the American West as well with uh, with indigenous people, like the Apache, the Comanche, and they would have been doing this to like the Papago, the Pima, uh, Tahona Odom, people that lived along this, the southern coast or the, the southern border with the U.S., with Mexico. Wasn't there then, but it, there's bride stealing, right? So like, if you need a woman, you, you take one, you, you just grab one. And the point why I tell you that is because in different parts of the world where they have similar geography, you can find similar styles of uh, cultures arise to meet the demands of that area. And what you often see on steps 
is a culture of bride stealing. So this is wide open plains because of the wide open plains, nowhere to hide. And because of the lack of political institutions that take hold in those places, then you have bride stealing. But in a specific part of Mongolia and other parts of Central Asia, there is this, there is, this is like higher up. This is in a very specific area. They have a style of marriage um, where brothers share a wife. And there is a short article written that's literally called, you can find it if you search, where brothers share a wife. And their custom, because of the issue of land, because of the issue of a lack of land, because over time, um, inheritance to children is one thing that cultural anthropology deals with as well. Because over time, these are um, these are pastoralists. These are people, or they, these are people. They're herders. Okay, they have like horses and yaks and sheep and shit like that. They um, they need land to feed their flocks, and um, so what they do is. The brothers that a family has, those brothers will get one wife. So one woman will come and marry a group of one or two or three or four brothers, and they share it equally. They have, there are specific customs to make this into not a problem, to have not violence. There, there's, so there's not violence between the brothers. But what that does is the kids, so the rules around the kids, like, through custom, they're supposed to treat the kids regardless of which brother fathered it, even if they know they're kids of all the brothers. And then it's limited because it's the opposite of polygamy. It's the other one, the less common one, polygyny. Um, it's the amount of kids they can have. A man with three wives can have like 30 kids, but three men with one wife, they can only have, a, it's limited by the woman. So what that does is it keeps the population low it keeps the family it keeps the family plot of land within one family mm -hmm. um and yeah that's that's what i want to tell you because that's a really weird thing right it, you know yeah, people yeah. think it's normal for one guy to have multiple women but one woman is having sex with multiple brothers it's like the hell's wrong with this homie hop and hoe um <laughs> that ain't right like in our society that she'd be gross but mm -hmm. in in this society it's like that's the custom yeah. the culture was created in order to serve this uh specific need of this area that's uh actually fascinating because it, it's it seems actually like a balanced system although i feel like you would have lots of violence just because once again if i understand there's like institutions around it but like you're not going to get guys to not want to know that the kid is theirs. And I mean, because if you're raising somebody else's kid, that's not yours, you know that that kid, once again, is not your genes. And yeah. our, our men have an innate revulsion to single moms and people can get mad at me, whatever they like. I, one of my biggest controversies on Twitter was uh, saying that stepdads technically are cucks. I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's not a moral thing. It's not a judgment on that. I'm just saying you are raising another man offspring there's yeah. nothing morally wrong with that if you want to make that choice just don't tell me that i'm an asshole for not making that choice because i made the choice i want my own kids right yeah my wife and i you know closed on my end closed on her end we're going to be married we're going to have kids we're going to raise our own kids we don't want anybody else's kids that's that right um now you obviously in this culture we we praise stepdads and single moms and think that that's just the greatest thing in the world i mean um, somebody yeah. does Right. Well, yeah, a lot of people do. So it's yeah. it's interesting to me that that's kind of like a norm in another culture, whereas like it seems like throughout history, patriarchy really was a more balanced system because um, when feminists talk about patriarchy, they kind of interpret it as like the man has this authoritarian hold over the family. And while that may be true to a degree, he's also responsible for the prosperity of that family, mm -hmm. right? Where the woman... Um, you know, like we think about hunter gatherer societies. Um, this is an interesting conversation I had with uh, Alan Flanagan talking about like ancestral diets. Um, the reason why I'm kind of going to this is that we forget about the gatherer part, right? Like our mm -hmm. ancestors used to eat up to 60 grams of fiber per day. Right. Yeah. And, and like when you talk to people about ancestral diets, yeah. they typically think of like, oh, well, I just would have killed a woolly mammoth and ate the woolly mammoth. Well, no, no. the men went and killed the game. Right. We got the lean yeah. meats and then the women and the children would stay at home. They'd pick the berries, they'd get the fruits and stuff like that. And, and that's what they're eating most of the time. 
by the way. Exactly. Right. The hunting so, is yeah. necessary for the nutrition, but that's right. very every once in a while. They don't have a fucking refrigerator, dude. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, women's well, that, work. Yeah. yeah. That's why we also had like fermented foods and, you know, why we really do have like our culture, there's cultures around food and like practices around enjoying food with other people. And that's why mm -hmm. I think, you know, as a species, we do like to, you know, we got to eat. We like to go drink alcohol in groups of people. Yep. We go don't do that with ourselves. With the enemy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. Um, the, uh, God, there was something you said that, that reminded me of something. Um, I'm sorry, I cut you off, man. I feel no, bad. no, you didn't. You didn't. No, no, no. I cut <laughs> you off and I thought of something. Uh, no, the hunter gathered. So here's what I think that feminism gets wrong. So two, here we are, two cis straight white men talking about what feminism is, is uh, <laughs> wrong with. But like, it's something I think that feminism gets wrong that is not like, like, I think that this is something that, okay, I'll just, I'll just get to it. Yeah. So in, in a society like a hunter gatherer society, you have, men's work and women's work and there isn't necessarily in that society you you have to create a value system in order to judge that the men's work is more important to you than the women's work mm, so if I you decide that if you decide some criteria for judging work in general then you will have um uh then you will have like Th value. then somebody's work is going to be less good than others you have a value but, hierarchy essentially right you have a value hierarchy but what people don't understand is that a value hierarchy is is pretty much like that only exists in settled societies mm -hmm. so there's an example here that i'm going to use which hopefully will blow your mind it'll blow somebody's mind but like you know i did something on medicine recently right so there's there's this idea have you ever heard of a medical anthropologist yeah right so a medical anthropologist quickly for people listening they like they deal with medical stuff and how it relates to human beings so they do a bunch of different things mm -hmm. but uh, what medical anthropologists have found is that like i'll back up for a second so a disease right so a disease we diagnose a disease but a disease is certain traits but more than certain traits it's you know how we socially think about certain traits and what they are and what deviations from norms are you know so we'll diagnose kids with adhd because we want them to sit in a classroom for eight hours and it doesn't work mm. whereas you know maybe you just shouldn't be doing that to kids uh but it's it even goes as deep as something like schizophrenia so if someone is schizophrenic in modern society because they're being judged by the standards of modern society Mm -hmm. then they're they're viewed as pitiful and unable to do anything the same thing with mentally challenged people what you'll find in combination with abortion is that you know there is a campaign to save um to save uh people with down syndrome from what some would describe as genocide i'm not necessarily saying i'm calling it mm -hmm. that but but like people abort kids with down syndrome now almost all the time so that the idea that we should do that is based on a single standard for what we view as success in this world. And that's where you get girl bosses and all this shit from, whereas there is one path and the path to success is uh, essentially based on what straight white men would historically do. Right. So it's based mm -hmm. on it's it's based on white Western American culture. Mm -hmm. So but you shouldn't judge like for me, that's fine. I, I'm well, it's not because I'm a fucking like neurodivergent weirdo and I, I have a podcast. I'm not accepted in like polite society, right? But like if I were a more normal white guy, then it totally would be perfect for me. Or it, maybe it would have been more perfect in the 90s before everyone started getting mad at us. But it the point is that there's there's a single track for what is valued. And that pushes people in directions that maybe they shouldn't go. And it closes off other value systems for being valid. So uh, valuing other things. So like, you know, for me, I look at somebody with Down syndrome and I've thought about this a lot. And it's like, if you judge someone with Down syndrome from the perspective of, oh, they'll never be able to get a job, to get a normal job, and they'll never be able to buy a house and all these things that modern society thinks are great, but they might have other stuff. You know, they bring joy to people. A lot of people with Down syndrome are some of the happiest people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they bring joy to other people as well. And there's value to that in society, but they don't make money. They don't have an economic value output. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how we judge it in society. 
Um, and with ADHD, you have to be like on it. You have to be able to sit down like that. It, there's a single track. But if you go back to hunter gatherer societies, you go back to a place where people can have different contributions. There's they're a they're asymmetrical, right? Mm -hmm. So a certain person's work, it's it goes back to like you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, right? But like there's a lot of truth in that because if you go back to hunter gatherer societies and a lot of hunter gatherer societies, you find someone with what we would today call schizophrenia. The people in that society give that person with, with schizophrenia a spiritual purpose. In a lot of hunter-gatherer societies, these people with, with schizophrenia, they're given a role that is in line with the way that they interact with the world. Mm -hmm. So this person with schizophrenia, they end up not being a risk. They're, they're not a danger to other people. Mm -hmm. They might be a danger to other people, but so can somebody who's not schizophrenic. Um, they have a role in their society that matches with the way that they interact with the world. Whereas in our society today, oh, you can't, you know, go work in an office in downtown Chicago for $400,000 a year. And then, you know, walk down the street to your Tesla. You can't do that. Then you're not worth shit. Right. And it, they say the same thing to women, like the value system and how we judge that women are oppressed in a society where they don't have the same, it's usually based on money. It's based on other things as well, but it's often based on money. Like that doesn't need to be the way that we judge the value of a woman or even right. all men or, mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, it, it should be much more, we should be much more. Um, and, you know, I can stand up here on my fucking soapbox and say what everybody should do, but I think it would be better for everybody in society if we had a little bit more of an understanding of different people having different things to contribute and not such a one track mind in what people are able to provide. Right. I, I think it's because we have like this idea of like pattern recognition where we've kind of seen, okay, well, straight white guys who are the most successful, um, they inhibit the, they, kind of cluster around these certain behaviors and that seems to produce good outcomes for them okay so if we hold this standard is true for them then when we apply to the same standard to black fat lesbian women then when they inhibit these behaviors then maybe they'll be just as successful and we sh yeah. we can hold them to that standard too but the right. fact is is that not everybody's equal and that kind of rubs some people the wrong way but it's not necessarily a bad thing because you know what if you look at my ability to have a kid I'm going to fail, right? Mm -hmm. I suck. 100%. <laughs> but if you look at my wife's ability to have a kid, okay, now she's really, really high in that kind of yeah. value hierarchy because that's more of her specialty. If you look at you know my ability to fix a car versus my wife's ability to fix a car, you're going to get two completely different outcomes. She's yeah. an EMT, I'm a mechanic. Now, if you look at her ability to drive an ambulance and file a you know, report and give someone immediate care, she knocks out of the park. Me? Yeah. I'm going to tell you, hey, just get on my back. I'm going to drive you to the fucking hospital. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So yeah. it's it's kind of like you said, we should kind of assess where people are their best. And this almost sounds like commie gobbledygook to um, w when you almost think about it. Because, you know, what, what's saying each to or from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that, though. And I know some people may think that we're almost kind of dancing around that. But it is just kind of assessing what people are good at and then trying to assign them to that task to make sure that they're being utilized in their best way, you know, rather yeah. than trying, like you said, trying to determine whether or not a fish could ride a bicycle up a tree. It'll never do that. But if you throw it in the water and tell it to swim, that's what it was made to do. Mm hundred -hmm. percent. Yeah. And it's it's. You know, it like I'm not even necessarily saying that just because like people have different levels of ability that they should all be given the same thing. I mean, people sure. still like, you know, some people value money and making money more than others and they have the capability to do that. So they go to a, a place where they can make a lot more money. Other people, they value family more. And I don't I mean, personally, I think valuing the family more than the money is probably a better path to happiness. No. So it's not like it's it's just money is the one that I think is overvalued the most mm -hmm. in our society. Now it, it's it's very important, especially because you know it can buy you, you know, your freedom essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but it's 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 not the only thing, and there are so many other things. And like, mm -hmm. I I just hate that people are trying to live up to a standard that maybe they don't even truly in their hearts want to live up to, but because it's pushed as like socially this is what is good for you to do that they're going to do it and like it's hard to know like for yourself how much you're responding to outside pressure when you're yourself trying to decide what you want to do with your life
right what, or what your values are mm -hmm. they're always influenced by the world i mean that's just that's just right the, the world and your culture and the way that you're raised and you know obviously your, your surroundings um jesus christ i can't believe we've already been going well over an hour it fucking flew by let's that's finish on a uh, <laughs> yeah let's finish on a little bit of a spicy one we were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier but um abortion and uh yeah of course this, this could be very spicy when you start off with that um yeah Abortion and uh, birth control really are a fail safe for women's bad um, reproductive decisions. And not a lot of people really look at it that way, but that's really the way that I look at it. Because what is the ultimate expression of hypergamy, which is women's desire to do better, is telling a man that you were not the one, right? Your genetic legacy will not go on. And that's essentially what abortion is. And you know, everybody knows me, my view is pro-life. And, you know, obviously you, you've said that you don't have strong feelings one way or the other. I'm not here to bend your arm any which way. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you essentially. Yeah. I'm just not like with you necessarily in implementation of policy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no. I, the, the policy part gets really, really sticky. Um, yeah. Uh, but from a moral and ethical standpoint, yes. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said, not a lot of people really view that as really in hit or saving women from their own bad choices. And, holding really holding women accountable and responsible for their reproductive actions and i think that really sets a bad precedent for uh women and to a degree men as well because right. um you know i do believe it is your moral and financial obligation to take care of a child that you put into somebody right yeah i, I mean there's no shotgun weddings anymore right because right. there's an expectation that why would you have a shotgun wedding when the woman can choose to have an abortion right even though for a lot of women, and this is not talked about, I'm sure you know, this is a terrible experience for them. This is socially draining. It can produce PTSD, mm -hmm. all these things. It's it's a it's a horrible thing that that and I'm I'm sorry to any woman, like I'm not attacking even women that have had abortions. I'm I'm sympathizing uh with it because it's it's if if you're if if a woman is, very few women, I'm speaking for all women here, you know, this this cis white guy again. Um very few of them do not have some sort of emotional lasting impact from that. And that might not be permanent. That might not be forever. But if they don't have some sort of emotional lasting impact, then there is extreme subsect and there's something very wrong with them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ, man. Yeah. We went all over the place and, uh, you know, we'll definitely have to do it again, man. I really, really enjoyed this chat. I remember looking in, um, looked at the clock about 15 minutes and I'm like, holy fuck, we already burned 15 minutes and here we are like an hour and 15 later. Dude, this yeah. was a uh, absolute blast. And like I said, we'll definitely uh, have to set up another one. Um, where can everybody find you? What do you got going on? That's cool. And anything you want to plug? Yeah. So um, Illegitimate Scholar Podcast is the main thing. All podcast areas. Uh, I've, I've switched up a lot of stuff recently on there. I'm also on YouTube and I'm on Twitter at ill underscore scholar. Um, so I, I, I do episodes on cultural anthropology podcast, um, topics, uh, and relating to history. I, everything that we talked about today is the kind of stuff I talk about on my podcast. Um, but those episodes now are coming out every other week on Monday, every, every other week on the other Monday is a conversation I'm having with someone else around similar topics. And then on the, on the YouTube Thursday night, soon to be on rumble and others, I do a live show on current events at 8 p.m. on Thursday nights on YouTube. Um, and that comes out in audio form on the podcast feed Friday morning. Um, and you can find me on all those things, Twitter, YouTube. But main thing is the podcast feed. And the main thing is those episodes, which in the podcast feed are just at the beginning, they're just numbered. The recent one is 034. The other stuff all has like letters in front of it. I'm trying to find the best way to organize it. It's it's a mess. But I I do all that. Yeah, we, illegitimate we all, scholar. <laughs> nice, yeah, man. I really enjoyed the podcast, and uh, yeah, I, I think we're all kind of figuring this out as we go. So, uh, oh yeah, man. If you have anything else, uh, we'll close her out. Yeah, no, I'm good. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Kyle. It's great, of course, man. Like I said, we'll definitely do it again. So, uh, one more time, everybody. Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out the uh, show sponsors. I got Element T right there, uh, as well as Tiger Fitness, where you can get all the greatest supplements that I use every single day of my life. And also go to foxandsons.com and use code Kyle at checkout. Until next time, everybody, thank you for listening and take care.